Spain, 1854. The country's first documented serial killer is sentenced to death for the murder of five people. The killer, Manuel Blanco Roma Santa, had become the source of national gossip. People called him names like the man of the sack because of a traveling salesman job he had, or the fat collector because there are rumors that he used the fat of his victims to make soap. And finally, his most famous moniker, the werewolf of Ayariz. See, Manuel Blanco Romasanta wasn't just a self-professed killer. In fact, he claimed even more victims than stated in his conviction. Romasanta, though, told the court that he was a werewolf, a claim that the court found important enough to take seriously. This is a study of strange. All right. Well, welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Michael May. Happy New Year. This is the first episode in 2023. And my guest today is RJ Blake, who is a producer of the other strange podcast in the world, Strange Phenomenon. Strange Do you also Phenomenon, call it? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Uh, it, it's an amazing, amazing show. Do you want to tell people about the show right now? I feel like your explanation will be better than mine. Sure. Yeah. It's like a documentary podcast that uses eyewitnesses and uh, experts to go into tales of the bizarre and the weird. So every episode covers a different topic, whether it's aliens or cryptids or just something like flat out weird. We have some that are just bizarre myths and bizarre <laughs> people who've lived insane lives. Um, and uh, we put them out in seasons. Uh, each one is like a full on documentary. And then we also put out the full interviews with each uh, eyewitness or expert afterwards. Yeah, I'm right in the middle of the Utah monolith episode right now, which I'm really enjoying because I, I that was yep. such a true phenomena when that started a couple years ago. So I know that took a long time for us to put together. We were re actually reporting on that, like as it was going on. I I got in contact with uh, Brent, who was the helicopter pilot that found it. I think the week that um, it all started going down. And uh, the thing that I like a lot about that episode uh, that I think goes into why strange phenomenon, what I like about it, and what I also like about a study of strange because you do the same kind of thing, which is the true story ends up being weirder than Absolutely. the myth around it. And yeah. getting into the whole art world and what has gone on with who's claimed it and the replication of it, of the monolith, monolith is uh, wild, is a wild story. Yeah, yeah. Truth is stranger than fiction. It is a very true always. statement. It always, always, always is. And it's what makes me mad in the movie industry sometimes because they'll always like try to change something in a true story. And it's like, why are you changing it? It's so much more interesting and weird. It's just not as clean. It's not a clean yeah. box. Well, we did um, we did an episode on this guy named John Murray Spear. And it is, I had to leave so much. I read the whole biography of him, like talk to the, the biographer and we had to leave so much out of his story just to be able to get it into the <laughs> Yes, but, yeah. Yeah. You oh. always gotta you always gotta cut down on stuff, which is it's yeah. tough, but that's part of it's part of doing anything. Yeah. Yeah. Let me do I'm gonna do a quick little little bit of biz here. Um, I do want to announce that on Patreon, which you can find through our website at studyofstrange.com, we're going to start releasing episodes unedited, or at least like mostly unedited, because I'll cut out like bathroom breaks and stuff like that, of course. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I am going to start doing that. Leave those in. Yeah, leave. I, I honestly, hey, it might be fun. Uh, but yeah, yeah check, check that out on our Patreon. And if you're enjoying the show, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review. And I'll just kind of leave it at that, because uh, we all know, we all know these things. I always feel weird doing the business, but that's what you got to do. So today, talking about strange things, RJ, we do have a werewolf story. 
And yeah, absolutely. He's giving me thumbs up. Now, this is not like a, yeah, this is not like a universal monster movie type of werewolf story. This is a serial killer story and it involves uh, lycanthropy. So have you heard of Manuel Blanco Roma Santa before? I have not. uh, Awesome. Not until you sent me the topic. (laughs) I love uh werewolves i think they're very underrated in both the whole cryptid community uh you don't hear a lot of people talking about werewolves and movies too i think there's not enough werewolf stuff out there so yeah i was hyped when i heard this yeah yeah it's it's truly fun and i don't know much about werewolf lore outside of like movies so it was really interesting i i'm not going to go too much into it i'm going to go into some of it today but like yeah. the lore and the history behind werewolves is absolutely fascinating. And and honestly, maybe it's just because I don't know it as well, but it seems to be stranger than like vampire legends and stuff. Well, it's like very tied in with vampire legends. Like a lot of early vampire stuff, even you you read Bram Stoker's Dracula, he can also turn into a dog, not just a bat in that. It, so there's a lot of interconnected of those. but. Also with witchcraft, it was a big thing. And I know that there was like this this beast in France once that they thought could be mm-hmm, a werewolf mm-hmm. that like yeah. the whole French government like bandied to go kill this thing. So yeah. it, there's some some interesting stuff with werewolves out there. A- absolutely. So the story today is a man, uh, I've already said his name, but Manuel Blanco Roma Santa. He is Spain's first recorded serial killer, and this is in the 1850s. He killed, depending on what you read, he killed at least five people, up to potentially 13. And I am going to give a bit of a call to action to the listeners out there, because when I was researching this, this is the first like serial killer story where I cannot find details about the murder victims like at the scene of the crime so to speak like i don't know what they were killed with if they were dismembered if they were stabbed if they were beat up if they were strangled i don't know any of that and i think the information exists out there because there are hundreds of pages of court documents but they're you know we're thousands of miles away i can't find anything online that's translated into english so if people out there there's people much better than me at sleuthing this stuff out if any listeners out there can find the details to the the murder victims at the scene of the crime uh let me know send me an email studyofstrange@gmail.com and i can do a follow up cuz right now it's just like oh he killed these people and it's just kind of like there's actual court documents from 18 18- Oh yeah absolutely that's awesome isn't that amazing that's so cool it's a i there's stories i've worked on from documentaries and tv shows where it's like a missing persons from the 1990s and you can't even find like police records and yet they have hundreds (laughs) of pages of courts documents from the 1850s in spain um so yeah if anybody can help me out on that i would love to to do a follow-up and get into some more detail than what we'll be able to do today And this is also a strange case because it is the first or only major court case that involves lycanthropy, which basically just means being a werewolf. But there's two versions of the definition of lycanthropy. There is literally turning into a wolf, a werewolf situation, or this psychological belief that you are a werewolf when you're not. So it's it's sort of it's a psychosis. That's probably not the right word. And we will discuss both because they are both part of this case. And werewolves, as you've already mentioned a little bit, uh, they're very much influenced by movies and stuff today, but the history of them is influenced by religion and culture and all those other things, just like vampires, as we've already mentioned. And it typically just involves a human who can shapeshift into a wolf-like creature and then eat people. I mean, it's pretty, pretty simple, but you know, you got to say it just in case. And yeah. lycanthropy, for the most part, can be traced back to at least the second century BC. There was a Greek geographer who traveled around the Greek Isles named, I'm totally going to butcher this name, so I apologize, Pausanias. Pausanias? I did take Latin for two years, and yet I can't remember how to say these things. I think that's as, uh, better than I would ever do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he wrote down a bunch of stories during his travels, and he related a story of King... Uh, Lycaon, which again, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong as well, who transformed into a wolf because he had sacrificed a child at the altar of Zeus. 
And in some tellings, the child is his own child and other tellings. It's someone else. Like there's various versions of this legend as there are with any, any legend. However, he eventually like transformed into this wolf. And that's where we get the word lycanthropy uh, from King Lycan. Now, as time went on, these things morph and change with culture and religion and history. And in Europe, primarily, which is where you see the werewolf legends and lore, it's obviously Christianity is a has a huge impact on on the legends and beliefs around werewolves. And you say Christianity might you like Christianity, really werewolves? Well, yeah, they talk about the physical metamorphosis of people in the capit capitulatum capitulatum there we go capitulatum episcopi uh which is part of the council of ankara in 314 which is basically a document that helped the church figure out their relation and their beliefs around magic and witches and transformation so mm-hmm. werewolves do tie in with literature around christianity and in the fifth century talk about witches earlier there were werewolf trials, much like the witch trials. And this started in Switzerland and then it spread throughout Europe. And when I was reading it, I didn't go too much into it because I didn't want to spend eight hours on like the history of werewolves today. But it does seem a bit like people were kind of done with witch trials. Like, all right, we did that. <laughs> and they were just like, what's next? Like, we got to do something else for fun. <laughs> witch trials out. Werewolf trials in. In. We got to do werewolves. Hot. Yeah. I could see a meeting of executives being like, all right, guys, we need something else. What do we got? We got like... uh... We're we're, we're burned. Our last (laughs) four witch trials, they tanked. We need something new. We need something new. We we, got to bring in the new generation. Yeah. Yeah. So they swapped over to werewolf trials. And uh, yeah, and that that spread. And so the region of our tale today, it's in a region called Galicia in Spain. And that's where Roma Santa spent most of his life. And they still believed like there was were a lot of local beliefs in werewolves in this section of Spain. And it's kind of like the northwestern part of Spain, like just north of Portugal for people that that know geography. And to understand the beliefs of werewolves in Galicia, I'm going to actually quote something that I read on GaliciaAlive.com about werewolves. The causes behind this transformation are diverse. Curse, enchantment, divine punishment, and action of the devil. Werewolf folklore in Galicia specifies that the seventh child of any union is likely to be afflicted with a curse. If the child is a girl, she's liable to become a witch. If a boy, a werewolf. The godfather may ward off the curse by saying certain prayers at the baptism, Generally, the curse doesn't manifest until later in life. An afflicted werewolf will feel compelled to undress at a crossroads and wallow in the mud. If a wolf has already wallowed there, the transformation occurs and the werewolf uncontrollably attacks and eats defenseless people and babies. So that is, yeah, yeah. There's a lot to unload there. And notice here when I was like, you know, we're influenced by movies and stuff today when it comes to werewolves, like you get bit by a werewolf or whatever. But there's a ton of of various beliefs throughout the history of werewolf lore about how the transformation takes place. And it's not like it is in the movies. It's curses, divine punishment. Like they said, the devil is obviously, especially in Spain, where there's a lot of Catholicism. The devil is a big part of the belief of this. There's also some I read about, like, if you drink water out of a footprint of a werewolf, you will then also become a werewolf, which is an interesting. <laughs> That's a very interesting move. I caught my dog yeah. at, uh, licking out of a puddle the other day, so got to uh, actually make sure that he's not a werewolf. Like, you got to be careful. He'd be, about, yeah. like, he'd be like a 20-pound werewolf, but, mm-hmm. you know, pretty could get pretty vicious. You know. uh, but, hey, small and feisty. And that's actually part small of today, and too. Feisty. Yeah. So Roma yeah. Santa himself, which we'll get into, was a very tiny person. So he had a bit of that small okay. dog syndrome. So <laughs> very yeah. feisty werewolf. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, one other thing that I thought was interesting about what you just said was the, um, the aspect of adolescence for the witch or... Uh, yeah. The werewolf once more going very much into straight up puberty like that moment where hair is growing you're getting wild you have so much energy unbound that's a very interesting uh moment there that, uh, that's uh, that's 
that that's a, an, an amazing observation, I think, because that historically yeah. I didn't think about that, but that has to have some impact on the belief of these kind of things. You would imagine. I think that's a, it has to be a huge part of it, and with the the child eating too, that's been used for centuries to demonize people cannibalism. It was actually used to demonize um, Christians at mm -hmm. a certain point because when Christianity was first uh, becoming a growing religion, like during the Byzantine Empire, uh, before Constantinople adopted it, there was rumors that Christians and Catholics were baby eaters because all that came out was that there's people drinking the blood and eating the body of their savior. What are they doing? Eating babies. So yeah. like very interesting, very interesting yeah. connections. I'm going to age myself with this uh, comment, uh, but I'm a big fan of Eddie Izzard. And it, like most Americans that became fan of his, fan of his is his uh, born. Oh, no, shoot. What was it called? Dress to kill was his comedy Dress special HBO kill. in like 2000. Yeah. And he does the whole thing of the vampirism bit of like, wait, that's you're drinking the blood. That's vampirism. You're a vampire. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> the blood of Christ. What are you doing? Yeah, uh, yeah very true. So uh, our our serial killer today, Manuel Blanco Roma Santa. He was born on November 18th in Galicia, Spain. And this is I had to work on my as much as I'm going to mispronounce everything today, which is just normal for me. I do work on it. That's the sad part because I, <laughs> I, I do actually spend a lot of time. But my my brain, having taken Spanish in America, where we're influenced from from all the Spanish speaking countries south of the United States, yes. uh, the pronunciation would be more like Galicia or Gal Galicia. Galicia. But in Spain, yeah. they have that bit of that like that lispy Galicia. kind of thing. So it's Galicia, Spain. And uh, he was born in 1809. And one of the interesting things about Roma Santa that everything you read about him brings up is that he was raised as a girl. He was actually raised as Manuela until he was six. And that is because his parents actually thought he was a girl. His parents were Miguel Blanco and Maria Roma Santa. And today, in sort of the modern thinking, we suspect that Roma Santa was intersex. And just because I wanted to understand this correctly, I'm going to quote from the Intersex Society of North America. Intersex is a general term used for a variety of conditions in which a person is born with a reproductive or sexual anatomy that doesn't seem to fit the typical definitions of female or male. For example, a person might be born appearing to be female on the outside, but have mostly male typical anatomy on the inside. Sometimes a person isn't found to be intersex, uh, isn't found to have intersex anatomy until she or he reaches the age of puberty. Oh, that's, that's an interesting thing. Some people live and die with intersex anatomy without anyone ever knowing. And this is a, about a birth per 1,500 births. So it's rare, but it, it happens all the time. It is not. Yeah. Rare. Yeah. And we have a lot better understanding of, of this today, obviously. I think historically, they would have used the term hermaphrodite. Um, yeah. And it typically... Historically, you can assume that people that are intersex are bullied and mistreated and misunderstood. There's a lot of history of infanticide when something mm -hmm. isn't quite right, which is just just awful. And Horrible. yeah, so it is assumed that uh, Roma Santa was intersex. He it wasn't puberty when they figured this out. It was actually at the age of six, so they figured it out very early on. A doctor is allegedly the one who told the parents he's he's actually a boy. They didn't legally change his name to, to Manuel until he was eight. So some stories you read, he was in, uh, a girl until eight. It's no, no, they actually knew it at six, but they just didn't legally change the name for a few years. Um, we don't know anything about how he was treated growing up, but I do want to mention that because we can make some assumptions that he might have been mistreated, not just by people in town, but also potentially even his parents. And and we don't know. I just, I, I, you got to think about those kind of things, I, I imagine. I like would imagine a, a heavily yeah. Catholic uh, region is probably not treating somebody like that very well. I mean, we see that today. Yes, you know? absolutely. Uh, as he aged, he was described as being very short. He was under five feet tall. He had blonde hair. And a lot of the engravings and paintings you see of him, he has dark hair. But that's probably just because his hair darkened as he got older. Mine did. I was a I was a blonde kid for some of my life. And then, you know, my hair darkened. 
it, he there are so many interesting little anecdotal stories about him being like a really kind of uh, temperamental person and mm. because of the whole intersex thing the older stories attribute a lot of that to him being different like uh, his, uh testosterone levels are all messed up Blah, it makes him really mean right and it's just like no i think he he just might have might have been a, a kind of mean person for for whatever reason i don't think it's necessarily i mean probably that. just like a, probably a very mistreated person who yep, yep. is redirecting a lot of their anger towards how they were treated mm -hmm. um very unfairly and uh yeah that's and, and take it out yeah now yeah. he was very smart he was educated he could read and write and do arithmetic which was uncommon in the small towns of galicia spain at that time so modern researchers assume that his parents were well off that they had a lot of money because you had to you had to have money to pay for education at that time um so they assume he came from a well-to-do family now, on March 3rd, 1831, he married Francisca Gomez Vasquez, and he became, became a tailor. And some of the stories say dressmaker, tailor. So obviously he's sewing, he's mending clothes, he's creating clothes. And in 1834, his wife, Francisca, died. Now, finding information about his wife, like her name, the exact date of their marriage was really there. That was the hardest part of my research because I was like, wait, when were oh, they married? Because yeah. people just mention it. Uh, they don't give details. And uh, again, records, 1850s, other side of the world in Spain. That's that's not hard to understand. But what's frustrating is I don't know how she died. So again, if people out there are researching this and have information, I want to know how she died. He was never a suspect in her death. I don't even know if she okay. was killed. Like maybe there was a health reason. But you do have to ask when you're dealing with a serial killer, like, could this have been his first victim? And that would be do a really know her interesting age thing. When she died? Oh, she was she died in 1834, and I would assume she was around the same age he was, so in her twenties. Yeah. So she was young. Um, so yeah, it'd be really interesting to find out if there are or or is information about her death outside of just she died and he wasn't suspected of anything weird. Yeah. I would also say during that time. Almost anything could kill you, though. Well, it's like, true. It is true. Your toe, yeah. You, like, yeah. You get a cut on your toe. That thing could kill you. you yeah. Know? Yeah. It, yeah. So. Yeah. To, I've been to doing play a little devil's advocate. A absolutely. It, and yeah. that's very honest. If people have been listening to my kind of recent episodes, I've done a number of episodes in the 19th century now. And I keep being like, yeah. life was hard. People went missing. People died. Like, it's like you're not going to suspect yeah. murder right away because this stuff happens all the time. Even on uh, Ancestry, so I joined Ancestry like five or six years ago because I always wanted to know about my ancestry and my family. My grandparents, whenever I asked them, would always go, eh, you don't want to know about that. And that's like all I ever learned in my family. So I had assigned, oh, there's nothing weird or mysterious. Just my relatives were all like Southern farmers for hundreds of years on every side of my family. But uh, what's funny is when you when you go through all the the records on Ancestry, so it's a lot of like birth records or census records. Everybody had like 20 kids and half of them die super young. Mm -hmm. And so you'll find the same name. So, so you'll be mm -hmm. like, wait, it said they had a daughter named Rose born in 1851. But then it says they had a daughter named Rose born in 1858. And you're like, oh, it's because the first Rose died. So they they used the name again. Like it was just keep going. So that's yeah. interesting. I had never thought about that before yeah that's very interesting yeah, yeah it happened i don't know if that was like a cultural thing in the south where my family's from or something but yeah you see the lot of the same name get used with a, a lot of the kids at the time so anyway, that yeah. is neither here nor there with mr roma santa but life is tough life is tough is the point yeah now his wife died as you can imagine that's a big change uh, in his life he actually stopped being a tailor and became a street vendor uh, essentially, I don't know what kind of goods he sold, but he would sell goods from town to town. It could have been a variety of things. It doesn't have to be like one specific thing, but he's he's selling goods and he's traveling. And what this allows him to do is to actually really get a lay of the land for sort of Western Spain and also parts of Portugal where he would go to do business. He learned all the roads, the routes. He got comfortable living and camping in the woods knowing his way around, how to communicate with people, how to hide out, got really comfortable with that lifestyle. 
And it took about 10 years before we get to his first known victim. It was 1844 near a town of Ponferrada and the autonomous community of Castilla y Leon. And this is more like centrally Spain. And mm-hmm. the story the story goes that he owed somebody money for goods. We don't know what, but he it obviously had to do with some sort of business arrangement. And he had some credit. Credit came due. And depending on the story, either a sheriff or a bailiff or a constable, honestly, for the sake of our story tonight, it doesn't matter. It's just an authority, an authority figure showed up to be like, hey, I'm here to collect that debt. Give me the money. This guy's name was Vincent Fernandez. And very quickly, right after he went to meet Mr. Roma Santa, he was found killed. Mm. So suspicion immediately lands on Roma Santa because they know that this guy was going to collect a debt. And Roma Santa flees town. And what's really interesting about this that shows some cunning, some education, some some street smarts is Roma Santa faked a passport. And he went by the name of what was his name? I think it was Antonio Gomez, I think is his name. Yeah, Antonio Gomez. And he just hightailed it out of town. Now, in Spain, I don't know if the law is still like this, but they still have a trial even without him. And if you don't show up for your trial, you're immediately found guilty. And the the timing or whatever their their sort of sentencing length was at the time was 10 years, which seems Oof. really tiny for a murder. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so he I sentenced- guess if you just it's that's where you kind of got to weigh your options. Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. how much do I not like this person? Ten years worth of not liking him? Uh, maybe, 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 maybe. So he's he's sentenced to ten years, but again, he's not there. They don't know where he is. Uh, he's he's just hightailed it out of town. But he is sentenced and convicted for the murder of Vincent Fernandez. So he actually moved back to Galicia, to the the autonomous region of Galicia in Spain, and he lived in hiding. And reports get really weird around this time because people don't know exactly where he is, but I was able to track it more specifically than what you typically read, which is Reberdachio. Again, pronunciations are terrible. Reberdachio, which is near <laughs> Ayariz in Galicia. And this is actually where the nickname, one of his nicknames is the werewolf of Ayariz. That's where it comes from because he was near the town of Ayariz. And he knows this area because he's from Galicia. So I, I imagine he feels comfortable. Mm-hmm. He knows the roadways and byways and, and routes through the mountains and all that kind of stuff, especially after being a traveling salesman. Now, I pulled up images and maps of this town. It is amazing. It is right out of a 1930s universal horror movie. I, it is a oh, small right. town, a little river running through. It's like a valley in between mountains. And the whole town is all the homes and everything are super close together. They're all made out of stone and brick, and there's mm-hmm. like wonderful little brick alleyways, and you know everything built in this time period, and it still looks like it's from the 1850s. It's incredible. It's um, constantly covered in fog. Exactly. Honestly, I mm-hmm. think every image I said was very foggy, or at least kind of dark <laughs> and monotone. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, it is. It really is. And uh, so he lives there, and. People described him as being effeminate, and that is because he worked, again, he was a tailor, like that was part of his his past work resume. So he has that skill. So I think he ended up doing various odd jobs in town, including knitting and sewing and mending clothes and stuff. So the, yeah, the guys called him effeminate. And he, however, was able, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, at this point, he's still going by Antonio Gomez, right? I think he went by, if if. It was actually really hard to kind of specify that, but I think he went by Antonio Gomez the whole time he lived in this town because he had, right. again, he had been convicted for 10 years. So I think for the next 10 years, he's kind of going by Antonio Gomez. I could be wrong because maybe he trusted Hey Small Town. Information doesn't travel fast. I'll just be a uh, Roma Santa. Like everybody knows me. So I could be wrong about that, but I think he's hiding out still. I think he's going to miss Yeah, yeah. 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 Now he became trusted, even though people thought he was a little weird. He w- became a trusted person, a trusted member of the community. Again, it's a small town, so everybody knows everybody. You can't not kind of get to know everybody very well in a town like this. And a woman came to him named Manuela Garcia Blanco, which is interesting to note because uh, Manuela Blanco was the b- first part of his name when he was <laughs> thought to be a girl when yeah. he was born. So I, I think it's just a coincidence. 
And Manuela had a six-year-old daughter. And this is, I think this is in 1846. So he had been in town a couple of years now. And she wanted to, she wanted to get out. She wanted to follow her dreams. She wanted to go somewhere and not be stuck in this town her whole life. And she knows that Roma Santa, even if he was going by a different name, I'm sure people, he had talked about things he had done for a living. So she knows that he had been a traveling street vendor. He knew the roads. He knew how to get around. He knew where she would go. So she asked him for help getting out of town and he agreed. And he took her out of town. She went home, said, said her goodbyes to her family, took her, her child and left with Roma Santa. Uh, sometime later, Roma Santa returns to town, tells everybody she's fine. She's having a wonderful time. She's staying with a priest right now. And, you know, good for her moving on with her life. So other women are suddenly like, wait a second, I want to I want to leave town. It sucks here. There's no Internet. There's no Starbucks. I don't know, whatever anybody complained about in the 1850s. <laughs> Um, they all want to leave. So next up uh, is actually Manuela's sister, Benita, and she had a, a young son who also was going to travel with her, and she asked for Roma Santa's help. So they travel out of town with Roma Santa, and they never come back. By 1850, so 1846 is when he takes the first girls, now 1850, Roma Santa had helped a number of people, most of them with small children, journey out of town. And their suspicion is starting to grow. It's not like hardcore, but it's starting to grow. And because Roma Santa had some leeway, 1850 again, slow communication. I don't think they even have like a wire service yet. Like there's very slow communication, small town. And How many of these people can even write is the thing. Too. Probably like... very few, like very, right. very few. But as you mentioned, writing, Roma Santa does something that actually gives him a little bit of help, but actually turns against him later. Uh, with some of his later potential victims, he returned to town with letters. And the letters are like, hey, we're doing great. We love it. You know, don't worry about us. We'll write soon or whatever. And spoiler alert, he, he wrote those letters. They didn't. He was, he was planting that. Yeah. What a twist. Uh, what a twist. And then Roma Santa made a mistake, as killers often do. And this one, for someone that showed a lot of cunning, is really stupid. He kept the clothing of his victims and he sold it to a vendor in town. So you have a small town where everybody knows everybody. And so everybody's going to recognize the clothing. It's not like today we're like, oh, that's just a gap shirt. A million people could own that. It's like clothing back then was very unique. You're, you're handcrafting it. You're repairing it yourself. So there's identifying marks in, in style and everything like that. So yeah, so he's reselling his victim's clothes in town. And this is where people start to go, wait a second, Roma, I think Roma Sant is killing these people. And a rumor spreads that he's now killed these people, including the children, and turned their fat into soap which is one of his other nicknames is like the soap maker. Of, oh my you know, the God. Of, there's, there's a, there's a nickname to it. Yeah. I do not know if that is true at all. That may just be like a local rumor that started when people are like, wait, what the fuck is going on? Roman Santa's leaving is... town. He's coming over, come back. Yeah. Well, hearing the close is not like that crazy for a serial killer. Most serial killers keep, you know, little trinkets, keep something selling selling it back like is a very ballsy move you know somebody in that town probably sewed that and it like spent hours on it that they see it You're like that's crazy the soap is disgusting but i wonder if it worked well you know <laughs> hey but that yeah it's it's disgusting it's terrifying it's as well and what's interesting here is that roma santa because of the rumors now authorities are like well gotta arrest the guy and here's where again some of the details of the murder victims are just out of out of reach of my research i don't know if they found any dead bodies before they tried to arrest it they may have mm. just been like we can't find these people we've got to bring them in so again a study of strange gmail.com if anybody knows if they found any of the i don't think they found all of them but they may have found a few and i just can't confirm that so they try to arrest him, but given his history with running away from authority, he kind of knew what to already do, and he had hightailed it out of town. I think this is 1852 when they go after him. And 
they actually this time they're able to track him down pretty quickly and they find him in a town called where is this oh they they arrested him in a town called numbella toledo and that again i think it's more central of spain so they get him they bring him back and he goes on trial and what's i've already said there's hundreds of pages of court's documents about his his trial and that's because his trial lasted nearly a year like he he was on trial a long time whoa and part of that is because of his defense which we'll get into very shortly um but yeah he goes on trial and i think he goes on trial for killing nine people so it's nine potential victims during his trial and those victims are manuela garcia blanco and her daughter petra benita garcia blanco and her son antonio land and uh antonia land and her daughter and josefa garcia and her son and a Mar maria dolores who was 12 so there's one, two three four five six kids oh yeah and it, yeah, it, it's absolutely horrendous and terrifying. And in the trial, this is kind of what made him not just a legend because he's the first notated, documented serial killer of Spain, but how he tries to either defend himself or what kind of plea he takes, however you want to describe it, is what makes this so fascinating. And this is where our first scene comes in. RJ. So mm. if you don't if you don't mind pulling up that documentary, do you have it in front of you? Got it right here. Okay. So do you want to be why don't you be Roma Santa? You're the guest. Be the be the star of the show. Sure. <laughs> sure. Let's do it. Yeah. My, so this uh, is my great grandfather's from Spain. I'll I'll channel him. Do it. Do it. So this is um yeah. just the first page is our first scene. And this is in the courthouse during Roma Santa's trial. All right, here we go. Inside a classic but tiny courtroom, Manuel Blanco Roma Santa sits at a table with his attorney opposite a prosecutor. A gaggle of public looky-loos gather in the back of the room. It's standing room only. A judge is at the head of the room. <clears throat> and how do you plead? Roma Santa's lawyer nudges him in the arm and gestures for Roma Santa to stand. Guilty or not, Mr. Roma Santa? Werewolf. Uh, ex excuse me? I plead werewolf, judge. The crowd gasps. What do you mean, werewolf? Well, I've been suffering from lycanthropy, your honor. I was out of my control. That's why I killed 13 people. You're on trial for nine murders. Oh, uh, well, uh, regardless, I am a werewolf. What a defense. What a defense. I mean, that's the way I doubt he stood up and was like, I plead werewolf, your honor. But that's the way I like to imagine him doing this. Yeah. And yeah, because that that's the that's the essence of the story of of Roma Santa is that he told the court that he was a werewolf and he was afflicted with lycanthropy. He he had been cursed and was killing people. It was out of his control because obviously he's a werewolf. And what I love at least in everything I've read, he claims to kill 13 people, but he's only on trial for nine. And I, I just, it's, it's so bonkers and bizarre. And part of me is like, is he playing a, an 1850s version of the insanity plea where he just wants to sound as crazy as possible? So even though it's nine people, I guess it's 13, I'm a werewolf. Yeah. Like, is that what he's going for? I don't know. That is for us to debate and think about. Did they and discuss. have an insanity plea then, though? I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Because I feel it, like they would be more willing to believe at that point that he's a werewolf rather than he's insane. You yes. know, like yeah. culturally, they probably were like, I don't know if this guy's insane, but it sounds like he could be a werewolf for sure. Yeah. So let's yeah. get into, we're going to jump right into our second scene right away here. And the second scene is later on in the trial. And I actually, for the first part of it, you're going to be Roma Santa again. The first, like, you'll have a little bit of a monologue here, but this is actually oh. a quote. This, yeah, get, get your voice ready. This is actually a yeah. quote from his trial. It's one of the few quotes that I can find from the documents. So uh, yeah, let's, let's dive into it. Weeks into the trial, Roma Santa sits in a witness chair next to the judge. The prosecutor stands before him. 
The first time I transformed was in the mountains of Kosu. I came across two ferocious looking wolves. I suddenly fell to the floor and began to feel convulsions. I rolled over three times, and a few seconds later, I, myself, was a wolf. I was out marauding with uh, the other two for five days until it returned to my own body, the one you see before you today, Your Honor. The other two wolves with me, who I thought were also wolves, changed into human form. They were from Valencia. One was called Antonio and the other Don Herano. We attacked and ate a number of people because we were hungry. Okay, uh, well, it, th this is very interesting. I believe you, by the way. Thank you. But only for the sake of the jury. Uh, we'd love to see the transformation. Go ahead and turn into a werewolf for us now, please. Sure. All right, go on. I, it's very dangerous. I, don't worry, we have armed guards around the room in case you get feisty. Go, go ahead, go ahead. It's, uh, here's the thing. I can't. Oh, you aren't a werewolf after all. No, 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 no. You misunderstand. I can't believe you don't know this. I thought it was obvious. I can't change because my affliction is gone. B gone? Of course. Lycanthropy only lasts for 13 years. My time with it ended just last week. Duh. Uh-huh. Prosecution rests. <laughs> very, Did he very actually nice. say that? That, that like, canthropy can only last for 13 years? Y yes, yes. So, I mean, uh, obviously, outside of that first, like, monologue, I'm doing my own interpretation of what potentially happened. But he did tell, I don't know on the exact wordage he used, but he did tell the court that it lasted for 13 years. The prosecution was like, go ahead, go, go, go on show us and he was yeah. just like yeah, but, but no it lasts for 13 years and i love that it was last week like that's when he was oh no it just it was just last week i mean if you got me just, a little bit oh, sooner uh, oh man could have could have shown you could have shown you could have shown you yeah and <laughs> oh now, yeah it's uh yeah i thought he yeah. was gonna say like the full moon but maybe that's not part yeah. of the myth no yet. it's not We're i think recording on a full moon last are we really moon. oh my uh -huh. goodness look I at that know. That is Werewolf amazing. In air. Werewolf in the air, indeed. I think just by talking about him, we are now cursed and we will become werewolves tonight. But I'm looking forward yeah. to it, honestly. I think it's going to be just loads, loads of laughs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, at the trial, the prosecution did, they didn't just go, hey, turn into a werewolf for us. They actually did various other things to argue. They brought in a lot of uh, doctors. Uh, the the best doctor by far they brought in is a person who studied phrenology, which is the study of bumps in the head. I'm sure you've heard of this, right? <laughs> Have you heard of this? It's, it, it is not a truth. It is a pseudoscience. But there are people, especially at that time, uh, there are people that believe like the shape and the bumps and the things in your head could tell them what kind of personality you have, what kind of temperament you have, if you're a bad person, a good person, like all that kind of stuff. And uh, what's actually just a little a little tangent here did you ever see i think it's called minute work it's a movie with charlie sheen and emilio estevez from like the early 90s where they play garbage men and they uncover a murder it's really no, good I it's haven't. when i was a kid i loved it because it's a it's a bit yeah. of like a humorous take on rear window the hitchcock movie all right and it, yeah and it's two uh they're brothers so it's real brothers in real life emilio estevez and charlie sheen playing brother i think emilio directed the movie too and they play garbage men that like witness a potential murder from across the street. But Charlie Sheen's character to, in order to get like a date with somebody, uh, I think in the building, they're trying to investigate the murder. And he, he says that he's like a world famous phrenologist or like he studies bumps in the head and he's obviously making it up. So anyway, when I think of phrenology, this that's what I think sounds of. insane. <laughs> it's called men at work. I think it's called men at work. Honestly, it is worth checking out. I hope, I hope it aged well. Because I loved it as a kid. But yeah, it, it's definitely like a humorous rear window uh, kind of thing. And yeah, I'm pretty sure Emilio Estevez directed it. I'm pretty I sure I mean, that's he did. peak Charlie Sheen and Emilio it is. Estevez. It is. That's it is like peak. when they were at their best. Like hot yeah. shots, young guns, you know, like It is right moment. then. 
It is right then. Yeah, check it out. Everybody, please. Uh, and then uh, producers of Minute Work, please. I will take uh, just 1% of any future sales from here on out. That would be fantastic. You get it. You deserve <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so Roma Santa, to get back to phrenology here, he was studied and examined by some phrenologists that claimed, no, nope, not a werewolf. I can tell by the shape of his head. Uh, and again, some other doctors came in and studied him and they all were like, he's not a werewolf. Everybody chill out. And at the end of the trial, I kind of give credit to the court system and to the jury and everybody else in this, because, again, there are strong beliefs for werewolves and curses and all that kind of stuff in this area. And they didn't fall for it. They were just like, no, you're not a werewolf. You're just an evil person who killed a lot of people. And so. He was charged with killing not all nine victims. He was acquitted of four. So he was charged with killing four people. And here is the most amazing twist that isn't even mentioned in most of what you read about Roma Santa. The victims he was not uh, did not get convicted for killing. He wasn't convicted for killing them because they were found to actually have been killed by a real wolf. So they were torn apart by wolves in the wild. And just kind of lumped in because they were the people that he helped get away. They were like, oh, he must have killed them. And yeah, this is that's this is a, a weird twin. I'm going to say yeah. that is weird. Like, that's a little bit weird. Talk yeah. about strange. That is right at the top of the strangeness for this series. And that's, again, why I want details on these murder victims. So, again, people help me out because because uh, I want to know how they were found and also when they were found. Because, again, I'm not even sure if they were all found before he was on trial. Well, here's an interesting thought. What if he knew they were killed by wolves and that gave I mean, him the idea? Like he was. Yeah, gave him the idea. For yeah. The werewolf. Yeah, you know? I, I think that's very possible. I had that same thought. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but he, especially because he was claiming more. Yeah. Like, would he have thought that there was a lesser sentencing if he was <laughs> accused of being a werewolf? It feels like that's like a burn at the stake kind of <laughs> yeah, thing. I yeah. think I'd rather yeah. call, be called a, a, a murderer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Especially if you're getting 10 years a person. Come on. Yeah. Like. Oh, yeah, I could wait yeah. 10 years for killing 13 people. I don't want to be burned at the stake. Burned That's at like... the stake or something. Yeah. 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 It is, oh, man. Oh, God. Yeah, that is. It's so bizarre. And it's a really weird defense. Yeah, it's it's that's why I keep toying around with the idea and I'm jumping a little bit ahead of my own like outline here. But my I honestly think he was trying to sound completely crazy. That's what I, I think he thought yeah. I can create some time here. The longer it's it's a bit of that like uh, it, like defense where it's like, I just want to create havoc and confusion and time because if I have time, maybe I'll come up with something else. Maybe I can escape. Maybe I can use a, you know, a fake passport again. Maybe I can do whatever. Maybe they'll quit me because they're confused. Maybe they'll just think I'm insane and I go to a, a not very uh locked down what do they call it like minimum minimum like security a, type place like or you get just escape. thrown in a madhouse is better than being thrown in a prison yeah maybe yeah, i maybe. don't know the like uh i don't imagine the uh a madhouse was like a great place to live uh, yeah, that, uh, no maybe no. better than a prison i don't know yeah or at least thought of or at least again my thinking is maybe easier to escape a madhouse than a prison yeah. you know like yeah I, so i that's my own personal theory uh, regardless he was sentenced and he was sentenced to die by gar garroting so it's a basically like an electric chair but instead of a, a thing connected to your head and electricity it's a thing that goes around your neck and they strangle you to death so that's the way they were doing um, executions in Spain at the time. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I'd prefer that Not or the cool. guillotine. They were still using the guillotine in France at the time. So maybe maybe I would have preferred that. But uh, yeah, just that sounds horrendous. The guillotine feels quicker. Yeah. And you get a look at your like body for a <laughs> yeah, few seconds. Yeah, you get that like, afterwards. ooh. <laughs> Oh wow, that's what I look like through somebody else's eyes. Wow, that's Weird. pretty pretty yeah. wild. Uh, yeah, you know, I think I would take the guillotine. Uh, I oh, I definitely. If, if it was yeah. between these two things, getting strangled is not not the th way to go. That is definitely not the no. way to go. And the end of the story here is that 
uh, he actually didn't get killed by the the sentencing. He didn't get strangled to death on this garroting chair thing because a- after he was sentenced, a doctor known as Phillips from France wrote into the the authorities, the government, whatever office you send a letter to like this, and asked the court to delay execution because he claimed that Roma Santa is possibly suffering from lycanthropy, the psychological version, not actually turning into a werewolf, but this rare delusional belief that you are a werewolf or you can turn into an animal. It's a it's a disorder of the mind or something like that is what he called it. And he wanted to study Roma Santa. He thought it was very important to study him from a psychological standpoint and did not want him to die. So they had time to study him. He was not associated with Roma Santa. This isn't like an old friend that was like, oh, let me help this guy out or something. He was just a a doctor that wanted to study him. And stories are that the doctor wrote the queen and she immediately like commuted his sentence to life instead. However, I was able to realize that or, or find out that he actually went through the very normal, correct channels. He didn't just write the queen. It was like, dear queen, please stop it. <laughs> he actually like wrote the appropriate authorities and the letter eventually made its way all the way up to where it needed to go. And she agreed with some of the other authorities that like, OK, let's commute his sentence so that we can study him. So he ended up getting life in prison instead. It is believed, however, that he died just a few months later in prison. We don't know why. Some stories claim that a guard killed him because he was saying, turn into a werewolf. I want to see you turn into a werewolf. If you don't, I'll kill you. And of course, he couldn't. So he was killed. That, I think, is just pure local or not even local, but that's just pure legend. I don't believe that for an instance. I can't find any, any confirming evidence of that at all. I did read that he died of stomach cancer in one of the the accounts I found. And also the date of when he died, he was sentenced in 1854. And a lot of these stories say he died a few months later. But some of the stories say he died in 1863 because of health regions like stomach cancer. So it actually, I think he did. I do think he did live till 1863. That's my own uh, sort of conclusion after going through everything I've read. Uh, but again, it's it's a weird time where they don't keep records very well. So we don't know. We just know he died in prison. That's what it seems very, very evident. Well, I guess at that time, too, if you if you just like if you're saying this person's living their entire life in prison, like why even keep yeah. track? Do yeah, you know? oh, like, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I've tried to look up, you know, police reports and court reports from things in our lifetime. And people are like, I don't know where that went. So yeah. <laughs> you can imagine where happens things go back the then. It happens all the time. Now, there was Actually, a, doc- a little concerning, but that's a different Yeah, right. Context. Oh, absolutely. It's that's always very concerning. <laughs> now, there yeah. was a documentary made in Europe, uh, just to, I think within the last 10 years, that said they found evidence that he lived in a prison until the end of his life around 1863. And they found like the specific prison he was at and all that kind of stuff. I, however, cannot find a copy of that documentary. So I got to keep I got to keep looking for it because I guarantee you it's somewhere to see. Was it like a full documentary? Was it like a, I think it was like a TV. Program? I think it was a TV program. I think it was like was the it BBC. And, it might have yeah. been actually. Yeah. Quattro uh, Millennia is like a very popular uh, like uh, tabloidy kind of yeah. almost their version of like alex jones but more like conspiracy <laughs> theory I, I i know that they've covered this at least i'm pretty sure they have because they do have other bits and pieces of this story that i found on youtube that was them at least i think that was yeah. them. um so i they may have done it if it wasn't them it was someone else like that or it could have even been like a discovery channel you yeah, know, yeah. kind of thing um so i am looking I, i'm sure i'll find that somewhere i just haven't been able to yet and yeah outside of all that there's not a lot of other details that i can have until i can find information about how the bodies were found how they were attacked like those to me are the most important pieces of this is like when were the bodies found how were they found how were they killed did he kill them i definitely think so i don't think he would have gone down this unless he really did believe he was a werewolf which is another potential theory but I kind of think he was just using it as a as a weird defense. I mean, he has. I feel like he has to have killed them because he was confessing to even more 
murders, which like feels at least accurate to me. You would imagine even maybe before the first confirmed murder that he uh, probably murdered somebody else and got away with it if he thought that he could murder like an authority figure and just disappear. That feels like not the first person you kill. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Like, so I feel like he must have murdered others. I do think the fact that some were killed and eaten by wolves is bizarre. And it, the, it, it's like a weird feedback loop, you know? You know, and you just said something that I think is really interesting. You said killed and eaten by wolves. And it made me think, what if he did kill them? And then they were mm. eating by wolves because wol wolves will do that. They don't have to kill their prey. They will scavenge. That's true. So I, I wonder if that happened and that just kind of destroys certain evidence about how they were killed. And it's like, okay, we can't get them for these because they were they were completely eaten by wolves. Um, right. That's that's something to consider. Again, we can't confirm that at all, but that's an interesting thing yeah. that I just hadn't thought about that you made me think of by the way you phrased that. There is something else, and I, I'm realizing this now as I get to the end of my notes. I don't think I wrote this in because I don't think I was able to. What I try to do when I research is, unless I have like an authority figure that's done years of research on a topic, I will try to like almost like a journalist where I want to see the same information confirmed through various sources. And if it yeah, isn't, I'll, sure. I just won't necessarily comment on it unless it's an interesting thing. Like, I'm about, yeah. But I did find one source that said, he he actually told the court where to find some of the victims. So yeah. I do think I don't think they found everybody before he was tried. If that is true, that he did tell them where to find some of the, the bodies and they found him there, which is an interesting thing to think about, too, because why if he's claiming if he was just being like, I'm innocent, he's never going to do that. But if he's claiming to be a werewolf, he's going to be like, oh, find the rest of the bodies over this way. And they find them. And that to me is that's an interesting, very kind of like a normal serial killer thing where he either he either may want the credit. His, he wants the credit. Thank you. He yeah. wants the credit. He wants to kind of revel in the glory. But he is taking this spin of werewolfness. Yeah. I mean, th there's an aspect, too, that uh, if he did believe that he was a werewolf, there is a possibility that he felt like, and maybe all the persecution throughout the years of his life, felt like he did actually want to be punished for these crimes and these things that they did. And maybe he felt as if confessing was a way of, like uh, absolving sin to in a certain oh, way you oh, know that's interesting yeah that is really interesting and and all of this kind of this is all circling a larger topic topic about understanding trusting believing in psychology because the mm -hmm. the the science of that was not i mean it was starting around the 1850s but like modern psychological beliefs and studies and all that kind of stuff were still in their infancy and i think i would imagine especially in a heavily religious community like this that there was not a lot of trust in those things they're going to go to phrenology before they're going to go mm -hmm. to a doctor of psychology so it, it is it's there is a psychological element that i feel like we may never be able to pinpoint because they weren't looking at him from that respect there was that phillips guy that wanted to study him for lycanthropy but i don't think we ever got full studies out of him there just doesn't say right. anything after he goes to prison but uh yeah there's a psychological element that's missing from this as well that we just don't we can only conjecture right because especially at that time if you don't fully understand what's going on with your body and there's confusion with the doctors and your your whole life has changed and is changing throughout i can see a world where with the mythology with the belief systems that are going out on at the time you could particularly if you're in this traveling roving band where i'm sure you're hearing bits and pieces from other cultures are coming in i could see a world where you start to believe that you are a, a werewolf like no, yeah. no yeah. other you're 
at least you feel very othered by other people and you try to find an explanation for what that is, you know? Yeah. Um, and that could have been the answer that he landed on. Yeah. I like that. I like that. It's bizarre. I mean, it's a very interesting, very interesting story and like a very tragic, sad life really at the Mm -hmm. end of the day. Um, for everybody involved. I mean, how many children and, and the family members had to lose their life because of it. it it's, yeah. It's very sad. It, it, it's terribly sad and it worth, worth looking into and sharing because I do think, uh, I do think there is value in these kind of stories. I would, if I wouldn't have a podcast like this, if I didn't yeah. and yet, yes, there is a, there's an entertainment value and I do love mystery. That is kind of my, my big passion. But there is some, there's always something to learn and like how how we are as humans, how we react to these things, what makes somebody do terrible things. There's always something to learn. I don't always know what that is, but, <laughs> but, no, but there's, there's always something to learn. That, like, <laughs> yeah. Through every mystery, through every to- story, there's all there. A great story, a great mystery has underlying human pathos to it mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. things to pull out. And I think you know, this is a great version of it just through the historical aspect of what was going on through the, the trial aspect. I I'm a person who, uh, has a lot of lawyers in my family. My dad is a lawyer (laughs) and my sister went to law school, uh, and worked for the innocence project for a while. Nice. Nice. I've worked on like true crime shows. And so you bring a trial into a story I love it. I'm all, yeah. I'm all in on yeah, a too. trial story. Cause you get that it, it feels more legit, I guess. Yep. Like there, yep. there has to be some like real basis in it. A- absolutely. Know? And that's why I love court transcripts and any story. I love mm-hmm. court transcripts. I find them fascinating. And it's also, I'm one of those people I've only been on a jury once and it was the stupidest Jealous. case in the world. <laughs> but I I loved it. Like, I was actually super fascinated. I was annoyed that I got chosen. And then I was also like, well, I'm going to make the best of this. It was absolutely fascinated, fascinated the whole time. But yeah, that I mean, that that pretty much sums up Mr. Roma Santa until until we can get more details. And again, I want to give a big yeah. a big call to action here for any listeners that may be able to track down more details of anything, not just the victims, but any other details. Because uh, it is a hard one to research, and I would love to to find more. So please email me a study of strange at gmail dot com if you can come across anything, especially the court, all the court documents. If there's a way to get those translated, man, I am all over that. And I was yeah. honestly kind of shocked because I think in Spain this is a much more po- like this is a probably a very popular story. There's even been some like movies made about it. Um, oh, that doesn't surprise me. Oh yeah, all. absolutely. There's two. There's two the trials I wolf. could find. Come yeah, the trial of the wolf. There you go. There's yeah. two that I could find, um, and they they seem very like you know Hollywood. They're, it's not Hollywood at all, but it, it's they've been changed dramatically, so you can't really deem much specifics of the real story out of it. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a famous story over there. So I imagine there's there's more information than we can find, and it just hasn't quite made its made its way into the pop culture over here, where it's easy to research. Um, all yeah. right, RJ, do you want to uh, plug anything here? Any of your true crime shows? Any? I mean, obviously, strange phenomena. Where where can people find you? What do you want them to know? Yeah, uh, I would say the best place is uh, find us. Strange Phenomenon. If you like this show, I think you'll really dig Strange Phenomenon. So check that out at strange-phenomenon.com or it's on every single podcasting app, whatever you're listening to this on. Just type in (laughs) Strange Phenomenon. You'll find it uh, and you'll get it there. No problem. We're on Instagram and Twitter and all of that at uh, strange underscore phenom. So find us there instagram we post the most at i think um and other than that i do some shows for watcher check them out they don't really need uh much more promotion (laughs) because they've been (laughs) blowing up but if you like watcher watch them go uh keep me employed through them yeah ghost files and uh some of their upcoming shows absolutely (laughs) And yeah. uh, I feel like we need to start some sort of like podcast union. It's like the strange podcast or just like a group 
I don't a lobbying group. There we go. Some sort of political lobbying. lobbying group. That's uh, yeah. all about strange, strange podcasts or podcasts that have mm-hmm. strange in the title. <laughs> oh yeah, get us. We'll get monsters among us in here. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be a party. You know? Yeah. Oh, that'd be amazing. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. cool. Well, thank you so much, RJ. We will talk very soon. And yeah, thank you for everything. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. This was a lot of fun. And that'll do it for the Werewolf Serial Killer. Thank you all for listening. Remember to subscribe, rate, and review. Check out RJ Blake's podcast, Strange Phenomenon. It's awesome. And then uh, check us out on Instagram at A Study of Strange. Send me an email with comments, notes, things I got wrong. Let me know. A Study of Strange at gmail.com. And check out our additional and exclusive content through our Patreon, which you can find on our website, A Study of Strange.com. Next week. I actually don't know what our episode will be next week because I have like three ready to go, but it just depends on the schedule of our guests. We're we're either going to do a strange phenomenon or a mystery that doesn't deal with death. Uh, You know, you you gotta take a break every now and then. So that'll do it. Thank you and good night.